uh, J.J. Roberts Stadium this time here. Uh, and then we also have Carly, who actually does all the work. Uh, Carly is the one responsible for the great weekly emails you get, telling you about who's presented here, how you can help them, the events that are going on in Tampa Bay, and a preview of who's coming up. Uh, you can get that email by signing up on the sign-in sheet there by Sean at the, uh, at the table. Uh, if you are not getting that email and have signed up, send it again. We'll, uh, we'll give it a shot this time. We'll get it right, I promise. Uh, so generally our format for, for you two who are going to be here, we have two startups from the community. They each come up here. They present for six minutes. Then there's 20 minutes of Q&A from the audience. That's your turn to ask questions, seek clarification. Uh, but make suggestions, make connections to your mental Rolodex, to your networks, to help them grow here in the community. Uh, we have two great ones today. We have uh, Eric, who's a, a longtime audience member, and, and here to present, and then Doug, who is uh, one of our early presentations, who's uh, gone through some great changes, one of my favorite pivots stories of all time uh, here. So without further ado, I will ask Eric to come up and tell us about you, Sam. Have that pool of cheap labor. 
and we have the skills and resources to refurb this boat and make it really decent for around three thousand dollars. Now we have a three thousand dollar asset, something that we can use to teach and learn sailing, boat repair, and maintenance, and something that regular people can access cheaply and easily. And now we have an untapped resource. When we put kids, boats, and dreamers together, the needs and the assets condense down to these. Look at how the assets cover many of the needs now. We can highlight the unfulfilled needs, storage, <coughs> support, knowledge, trainers. And that's where youth sale comes in, providing the organization, the knowledge base, the equipment, and the location, all the components that individuals cannot bring. Now, we have a functioning symbiotic relationship between kids, boats, and dreamers. Youth sailors refurb and maintain donated boats and rent them to a group of dreamers called Let's Sail. The boats are assets for recreation and training, and Youth Sail Incorporated is the fabric holding it all together. Notice that youth sailors are getting real life experience working in a profitable business. Youth Sail is incorporated as a nonprofit. So we can accept donor votes, volunteer labor, and charitable contributions, but the business is self-sustaining and profitable nonprofit. The youth cell program is designed for 100 kids, 25 come per day for about three hours after school and three more hours on the weekends. Let's sail group is made up of 130 sailing units, that is singles, couples, or families, and the fleet consists of 20 to 30 boats from 10 to 30 feet in length. And Youth Sail Incorporated includes six professional staff and a working waterfront location. We can talk more about that during the Q&A. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions.
a, an ESC teacher who has experience working intensively with kids in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. We could have the teachers, but what I'm asking is if I'm a teacher and I'm infiltrating this information to my kids, I don't know anything about family voting, but on your end, you provide somebody. So the second person is is, is the vote expert. There you go. Okay. Uh, so who, who knows, you know, votes up and down, whether it's whether it's the refurb, repair, maintenance, sailing of boats, safety, and, and other other issues like that. There's a general manager, a program manager, an admin, and a community <coughs> relations person. Okay. Great. And you mentioned location before. Are you going to come back to, to where you need to be, where you think about being, and how the kids would get from their school to your location and then home again, that, that type of logistics. Okay. Um, we mentioned to you, but let's talk about location. So one of the things that we need is we need a what's called a working waterfront location. I mean, somewhere we can pull boats out of the water and we can work on them and we can put them back. And such areas, it turns out, are actually quite rare. But there's one that's located just 10 blocks down south of downtown St. Petersburg. It's the Salt Creek Marine District. It's a designated marine services area and it's included in the waterfront's master plan because it's actually physical. In its heyday, Salt Creek was the largest marine services district on the Florida Gulf Coast. And it is one of the largest economic resources in the Gulf County. But its current utilization is less than 50%. The remainder is being used either for storage or it's just sitting absolutely empty. If you line up every one of the business managers down in Salt Creek, you find that all of them are over 55. And so they're part of a wonderful wave of Marine service people that came through in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but they're all slated to retire in the next 10 years. Now, I see Salt Creek as a huge sort of untapped resource here, but here's the bizarre part. Salt Creek, this amazing underutilized economic resource, is physically located in Southside St. Pete, which is the most economically depressed area in Nellis County, and yet there are no cultural or economic between the Marine District and the South Side neighborhood. This I just find to be strength, but it smells like opportunity. So in terms of a location, the location that we're that we're targeting is likely somewhere on Salt Creek. Transportation, we in general are thinking of, of having you know kids or parents bring the kids, but we have also had some offers from organizations that have transport services that we may be able to work. To, to that end, uh, is there another place, so if Salt Creek didn't work, is there another place this could go, uh, you know, where, could you rent, for instance, could you rent space from the municipal sailing center or something like that? Uh, the problem with that is that uh, when you, to physically take a boat out of the water and be allowed to work on it is you have to have a, 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 a working water on location. So, yes, there are other places where you can rent a boat from, but there are not other places you can work on the boat without working on the boat program. Great presentation, and uh, you know, since the first time I see it, it's a big change in having the slides to answer the questions. So it's first of all, here, John. Uh, I, I see how you're trying to go after both the, the repair side of the boats, but also the training about boats and training about sailing. Right? They're both, I think, very valuable and complementary mm -hmm. skills, but it seems like the first one probably has some greater challenges to the location getting the boats working on them. I, I don't know, it just seems like that alone is a challenge. Uh, what have, have you thought about first, I guess, maybe as Sean mentioned, getting the program off the ground by going to the municipal sailing center, uh, tar, you know, finding slaver target kids who you want to work with, and teaching about promoting and sailing. Mm -hmm. As a teenager, I would have loved even all that part to, to come with the kind of Okay. Uh, yes, that has been a consideration. Um, the thing is that there are there are multiple opportunities for kids to learn about the inside of sailing, but there are no opportunities for them to learn about the other side of the fiberglass, as I said, the, the, the main side. And there's nowhere for kids uh, to learn job skills, soft skills, hard skills, or the, the, the type of life skills. 
our primary focus is, is teaching them how to how to enter and succeed in, in the workplace. Uh, the sailing portion is it's a it's a hook, and we're very interested in that, uh, but it's really not the focus of the program. Great, and then just one follow up to that again. Just, I just try to always think of like smaller incremental mm -hmm. steps. Um, but it seems to me that even if I were on a you know political but you know, one that could actually sail that was just not in that great up with your thicker speaking about right um salt salt creek area. I would imagine there's plenty of lesson plans for just remote city and about uh, how to repair. You know, I imagine a lot of repair happens on the boats in Florida, right? I mean about the uh, so I guess my point is is could you develop some sort of lesson or curriculum or some sort of program around having a singular boat that's pulled up to a document location mm -hmm. that might not be the prime real estate for the marina but they say, hey, I'd be willing to set aside this one area if you get one three thousand dollar boat. Okay, you yeah, no, that's 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 the best one. Okay. And you teach you have yeah. a certain curriculum and that I don't know, just trying to think of yeah, that's a stage way to yeah. That was a good idea. Is there a certification for for repair of the boats that your students can work towards? Uh, there are certifications, for example, for you know marine mechanics and such uh, can have certifications. Most of them work on those. Okay. So there's no, there would be. But it, it is something that we could, that we could target as, as something to work on. Uh, but you know the, the the point is not to provide only the, the the hard skills in the marine services. To provide a more general uh, a general curriculum of the types of skills that could could apply in a number of. So we're looking around, around 14 to 18. So we're looking at kids that are, that are um, getting ready to enter the, the, the job. Second one would be with that, what for how old are you going to be talking about? You know, cheap labor. You know, are you putting in confidence in the kids who are going to be doing that with the job? So initially, the, the, the kids are working for gaining the, the experience. But eventually, one of the goals is to work them into a position where they have enough skills that they can work uh, even within the program, so that they, they can be uh, brought brought as interns within the program. Uh, free labor initially, but it, it's 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 a balance. So in other words, you know, you're 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 receiving some, you're you're getting skills and you're and you're using muscles. So. Actually, you said there's a there's a fee. What's that? There's a fee to it. Yes. Yeah, I just wonder, does something already exist, or what, what is it that you do? I mean, are you have a sale in school now, or? Uh, no, I, I, I do not, and currently, this is just in the concept phase, for, so this is something that we're... So the next sale, which you mentioned, also that's a... Uh, it's also in the concept phase. Okay. Do you mind if I talk to you about the Another thought, and this is just 
sailboats, not no power boats. Uh, so it's sailboats as far as the, the main fleet. Uh, power boats would be more used for chase boats and things like that. But there, there, is, there is an opportunity for uh, for receiving, donating the power boats and and uh, repairing those and reselling them or using them as chase boats. For them. Are there any thoughts of sort of maintaining used parts, things that you know, you could, I don't know what they would be, but parts of boats that people could purchase from you if you're a part of this program? Um, the, the sale of, of boats beyond what we can use is certainly a part of it. I would, uh, I, I know that's a little bit funny, but I would just your recommendation to drop the free labor piece because that could get you in trouble down the road, because especially if you're trying to plan a not for profit and for profit, you're talking about free labor. I don't know, I think that it's cheeky, but I don't know, it just could be something that could be uh, just a feedback. Uh, I was thinking, is there a, you know, if I'm a high school student and the idea is to learn skills and you know, potentially be employed in that skill, what would, you know, you, you operate in Maria, right? You're yes. Um, what skill would you want someone coming out of high school to have where it's, hey, we get 20 work orders a week of this one particular thing? I mean, is there a particular skill or two that you could train them on and get them interested in sailing where they're out of them?
at 11 o'clock, uh, Venture House, one of our earliest presenters, uh, is having a, a celebration to smash down the walls of their house. So you get to swing a sledgehammer, see the cool stuff they've been working on. Uh, that is, uh, it's near 18th and 22nd. I can't remember the exact address. It's, yeah. It's behind. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's today. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll look it up afterwards if you're interested in going. I'll, I'll let you know. Today is also the Florida Caregiver Conference, a large reason why uh, there are there. <laughs> so few people here today. Uh, Startup Weekend is coming up this weekend. Um, uh, that one is about drinks, beer, stuff like that this weekend. Um, that is over in Ebor, I'm assuming. Uh, the Business Empowerment Conference is much more fun. That's here in St. Pete. Uh, that's that Saturday. I will be here all day, or be there all day at PTC. That's all sorts of things about getting engaged in entrepreneurship, uh, in, in financial regularity, in starting your own business for youth, for folks with background difficulties, for people who are just sick of their jobs. There's all sorts of speakers. Uh, our keynote speaker is a gentleman who uh, he's one of the founders and one of the instructors for the Ice House program. Uh, then Coda Palooza is, is uh, something fine. It's happening in Tampa. It's dealing with homelessness. It's a uh, uh, professional program just getting together to think through those problems. More exciting than that, though, is St. Pete's National Civic Day of Hacking, which is that Saturday. No bias. Uh, I don't have any bias where you will see some of the best coders in all of Tampa Bay working on some of the most dynamic uh, groups solving the most pressing needs. That's at the Iron Yard. It's like from 8 to 8, uh, but more info will come out in the uh, magazine and then Ignite Tampa Bay. Uh, if you love hearing the sound of your own voice like I do, they are looking for speakers. That info will be out there. That's coming at the end of uh, June. Without further ado, I will cease. I'm sorry? The address. Ah, yeah. Uh, 1830 20th Street South. 1830 20th Street South uh, for, for the venture housing. Last, you were up here, you had designed a device to help uh, restaurants grow lettuce. Has, has that changed? Has your target market for that changed? Well, we designed an urban farm that we brought to St. Pete, had some great people involved and the city involved, and ended up to raise the, the money of urban farming get things involved and get back to the community. And the second question out of everybody's mouth was, can you grow pot? So we had to stop the urban farm. We designed an indoor grow with our system and raised enough money to move out to Denver for four months and test our system. And this is what ended up happening. Um, we were able to grow, it did work. We then set out to find a grower in Denver. And being an entrepreneur, you know, we designed this urban farm. We thought it was a great concept. We know it worked. We've been working for two years designing this system. And we got some community involvement, which was fantastic, but no money. So you have to be able to move. You have to be able to change and know where the things direct, where people direct you. We have since signed a contract with a Denver, one of the largest Denver pros, to put our system in. Then we decided, well, we really didn't want to sell our system because we want to profit from it. So we took almost the copy machine mentality. And so we uh, designed where we will install the system and get revenue from what our system produces every month for the next three years. Um, the market in cannabis is absolutely crazy. Um, the regulations change weekly. Um, there are a lot of people coming into the market that don't know what they're doing. Um, a lot of experts are saying they're experts and they're not. So it's been a little bit of a struggle. We've gotten the basic money. We've raised about a quarter of a million dollars to get where we are today. Uh, the contract. Our next step is to go out and raise approximately 2.5 million to install the, the system in Denver. The contract that we signed is three years and we're at a value of 15 million. 
have another group in California that owns our system also as soon as we get this one done. Um, so I'm here just to give everybody an update as far as being an entrepreneur, being able to change, you've got a goal, you design your system, but you have to be able to listen to people and you have to go where the market directs you and it's not always exactly where you want. The other thing is that I've learned uh, and on, like some entrepreneurs want their system to be absolutely perfect before they bring it to them. <coughs> and you just can't wait that long. It's going to take you months, if not years, once you start introducing it to actually get it into the market. So you need to start that relationship as you're starting to perfect your system. And, and that's what we've done. We're now at the second round. Here's a miniature sample of what the new tower looks like. We've changed the lights, and we believe that we can now grow three times the volume per square foot than anybody in the country. So from what one of my towers right now in Denver, the average grow will grow about 10 pounds in 60 days. My system will grow over 30 pounds in the same square footage. Um, but breaking into an industry that is over-regulated and out of control is not easy. And now most of the big investors really want a company that has revenue. We're pre-ready. We tested the system, we have a contract, we're ready to go, but when you're looking for bigger money, you have to look hard. And it's an industry that everybody talks they want to get into, so they start early money to cut the checks because it's still federally illegal. So you have to be really careful. Now, what we tell potential investors are, we're an equipment leasing and management company. We don't sell the cannabis, we don't handle the cannabis. So as far as the federal government is concerned, I, I'm not in that industry. I'm just in the equipment. Um, and those are the little niches that we're trying to work through as we develop the company. Um, the other thing we found when we were out in Denver is I don't grow in soil. And our roots just grow in the middle of the tower, just in the air. And that was perfected by Disney and NASA. And if you've ever been to Disney and seen the farm in the future, you see the roots hanging in the middle of the clear tower. It's basically that concept perfected it for this industry. When we were out in Denver, when we harvested this fruit, we took the roots and we sent it off to the lab and had process. And we found that we have, our roots have benefits. It doesn't have THC, but it has cannabinoids and terpenes that are used for lotions, creams, and all kinds of things. So now we have hundreds of pounds of roots that we can process to create a whole other market and revenue stream than anybody else has. Because, yeah, one day. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so if anybody has any questions as far as the uh, campus business and where it's going in here in Florida or, or uh, Denver, I'm glad to, to answer it. Can you yes. put your device up on the table here? Yeah. So the tower is 10 feet tall, the water goes down the middle, the plants grow out, and as you see we put a um, screen to hold the plants because the buds get really, really heavy. Screen? Yes. A screen to hold them because they will fall down. Yes. What is unique or defensible about your system and your design? That looks like a lot of off-the-shelf plumbing products, PVC, uh, piping. Can anybody do that, or what is defensible about your system? With our watering system, uh, we've uh, filled out paperwork for a uh, design patent for the watering system to make the water, and also the water flow down the middle. If anybody tries to copy it, we've actually wanted to set up a little miniature test of one tower just to do examples, and it failed. Uh, because it's very, very difficult to just do this, 
start watering in the middle and expect the plants to live. It's very complicated. So it can be copied down the road, but it's going to take somebody a year or two to develop. Uh, our margins, we're not expecting to take over the world. Our overhead is going to be running for the first row about $2 million a year, and our sales will be about $5 million. The grower, as he, we can double our number of towers in his row, our costs go up about $250,000, and our revenues go up another $5 million. So our profit, profit margin is huge once we get 20 or 30 of these towers in. So we're figuring with 24 states uh, legal medical that we could get a dozen companies around the country to put our towers in. We'll be making uh, 50, 100 million a year. We should be okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you have a three-year contract with the program. Yes. What is the lifespan of the tower? Um, the lights are 10 years. The towers um, approximately 10 to 20 years. What will go wrong are some of the pumps. Um, our computer system, we have, uh, to make the system run, we have backup everything, backup pumps, backup computers, backup sensors. Everything's monitored online. It's very high tech. Um, so we can do 10 years relatively easily, very quickly. Yeah. So at this point, will you sell to any grower or only Um, <laughs> right now, I have to say it, it really needs to be a legal state. You're in the work Wait, but why? I mean, this was originally developed for, for urban farms. farms. Yeah. If we can develop an urban farm. Can you sell it to an urban farm? Um, yes, we could do that. If we find an urban farm that, that, that wants to, <laughs> to put it in, it's a lot cheaper than an urban farm. Yeah. The most expensive part of this system is the $800,000 worth of lights it takes to do an urban farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does it have any other uh, applications um, in a more, let's say, uh, legal uh, arena? Or someplace, I'm, I'm thinking from like a desertification, right? So if you're over in Africa, for instance, um, you know, they have a very difficult time with soil and the, you know, agriculture and so forth. Yeah. Is there any way for an application there? Because then you have Hugely scalable model. Yes. Uh, we've designed for, like I said at the beginning, the urban farm. We've designed the system to work out of a container so you can ship it and then pull it out and make it work. Um, there's a lot of options that we can go with the margins and the investors to be able, we just have to know to find the urban farm. We really, we still love the urban farm giving back to the community and we really want to make that a charity, but we've got to go where the money is. And there, there's just so much money in Canvas County, you just can't. You know, if somebody steps up and wants it on an urban farm, I'm glad to talk to them and, and be able to do it. Yeah. Um, so can this be tailored to pretty much any plant? Or, I mean, you probably have a similar tailor this one with marijuana. Um, could it be like, if you buy type plants, if you do any kind of yeah, no, we're, we're limited. I mean, we can design it, the vines, you know, any type of product that uh, like potatoes and stuff, it's a struggle. We uh, herbs, spices, lettuces. What about hops? Um, hop, we've looked at that, and hops take, from what, I'm not an expert in hops, but hops take about three to five years for them to grow up to really put out a good quality product. And it's a bond, it's huge. Now, can we develop a miniature one through science? Yes, and so it could work. But there's a time period to uh, produce hops to make them mature to get what you need. But the, hop, the value of hops is almost as much as cannabis, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you say you have a contract, a three-year contract, is that just to lease these or to sell? It? Are you selling? No, I lease. You're leasing them. We put the system in, and you'll pay us eight hundred dollars for every pound of our system. For the next three years. Okay. Can you just leverage that contract? I guess you, 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 you said you said you have a little bit of So you have a contract that you can't produce, so you're not going to go. So can you leverage that contract? Well, that's what we're trying to do now. But can 
can't do it on the normal situations because it's federally legal. So banks are most mainstream. Factors won't touch a contract, probably. Not in this, uh, especially in this industry. We're talking with three or four people now to get it funded, but it's it's just a, a struggle. Even though I thought once we got the contract, and it's a good contract, it's a big problem. So at first you were selling just the equipment and leasing it, you didn't didn't matter what they, they really did with it. But then I heard your business model of eight hundred dollars per pound. Now you're profiting from the growing of that. And so well, the two questions is one, how do you measure what they grow and keep them honest to it? Because my my perception is this goes behind very closed doors where they don't want people to come in and rob them and strike this to be very closed environment. So how do you how do you measure that? Does that introduce a legal question and find out your your profit per pound? And I know you I, I don't doubt that it's complicated. To build it again, if I've all the time in the world and I've worked those walls, and at least one system from you, what really, back to Gene's question, stops somebody from spending all of their free time and saying, how do I make a second or a third, and going piece by piece and having the model there and come Well, with the contract, he's not allowed to do that. But if, and if I, he kicks me out, he still can't use my technology or what I do. It's within the building codes, but you know, every contract can be broken if you really want to break the contract. We also have a management company, so we lease it, but we also have our own employees in there, so it's all tracked every time, because in this industry, they have to be able to track what's put out. Okay, so that's a key piece that you didn't bring up. So you have your own people in the facilities where you're leasing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this, we've run into a similar challenge where when you're selling something into like your closed box environment, you can't get in there or know what's really happening or if they're copying and you legally can't your editor and all of those things. So you have a separate. So does your lease fee include somebody on site to, yes. to be there? Ultimately. Yeah. And uh, plus the and we can watch what goes through the system. We have cameras that monitor the bro who goes in, who goes out. And, uh, yeah. and those people only monitor your equipment, they're not trying. Have you met Professor Gurman over at Becker College? No. Okay. He has a PhD in cannabinoid biology. Okay. And he is working with, there are several farms here in Florida mm -hmm. that are sort of proof of concept for the possibility of the legalization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, he may be a good, con uh, good guy to come back for right now, working at a farm in Plant City uh, that's doing some proof of concept in anticipation of possible legalization that's running legal. Um, so you may, Greg is his name, he's over at the college. Okay, I'll get this information. All right. you, so you got a contract for three years essentially leasing, they, they stopped the production of, of what they're growing. And uh, how did you come up with a three year contract? And what happens after that? If he doesn't want us anymore, we pull the whole system out. It's automatically renewal for another three years. Uh, if he decides that he doesn't want us anymore, he can't put another growth system like this in for two years. So you got something in your contract that basically says you're using my equipment, and if you don't want to use it anymore, we're going to prevent you legally from putting another system in. Oh, is that going to hold up? I mean, it's a proprietary system, and if he uses our technology or the way we grow, he's agreed to do it. Now, can I stop him? You know, that's what lawyers are for, and just to fight it, and he's not going to want to just go through the whole legal battle. Uh, either he likes it, and he continues. I save him and make him a lot of money. Uh, he, it costs him $1,200 a pound right now to grow. So for me to put my whole system in and only charge him $800, he makes an additional $400 a pound, and he sells it for $2,400 a pound. Huh? That doesn't need I haven't gone to him because I'm making so much money they'll renegotiate the contract. So if I have to go back to him, you know, right. So, oh, of course. So you know, it's going to come to a point if I don't get funding soon, then we'll go back to him and say, okay, let's renegotiate the contract. And he'll fund it. He has 12 dispensaries and five grows in Colorado. He's the largest grower in New Jersey. And he's going for three or four more states. He hates to grow. He hates growing. 
Yes. So, so the three-year contract then, you know, if, if there's a, uh, a design timetable for someone to come up with something similar, something that does the same thing, mm -hmm. and you're saying, oh, well, that might take a year or two, why wouldn't you just, you know, during that three-year period, why aren't there a bunch of other people <coughs> trying to come up with the same thing? Um, because there will be, eventually. But right now, most of the professional growers are in their mid-20s. They just got out of college or they've been underground growers. They like growing in pots and the technique that they do, they don't want to look at any place else. Mine's a sensitive way of growing, okay? Um, when I was out there for four months, most of the people in the industry are potheads. And, you know, part of our business model is with him is, you know, there's no potheads going to be running our system. Um, they have to have, right now, a system that can deal with potheads, watering and screwing it up if they don't water, and the plants won't die. Okay? Mine's a little more sensitive than that. And nobody wants it because it's too sensitive and they're too laid back and no one will.
Do you have special lights that you're using with this? Or? Yes. Uh -huh. um, we're using a new LED light that will surround it um, completely. Mm -hmm. It's been tested for two years out in Denver. Mm -hmm. It's a big group out of Austin, Texas. And it is what we found was the best in current LED light that actually works. Yes. So I think you mentioned that, um, I guess, let's we'll start with my question. If I were an investor and I were looking at potential investment in the company, what is the ROI of life? And then you can actually start trying to profit to show uh, those investors based on your sale or your contract. The first crop comes out approximately six months after we install. So between the overhead, we've got six months. And in six months, we start generating approximately 83,000 a week in product. And we have a perpetual harvest. So we harvest three towers, two to three towers every week. So we have constant money coming in. Um, right now, we're offering an investor approximately 20% of the company and a guaranteed 25% return on their investment. And a CFO position to monitor their cash. Yeah. How do you guarantee that with your 25% return? We're a startup. I mean, we can, there's a couple of ways that we can do it. Um, we can make sure that we pay interest only to start out because we do want the capital investment. But, you know, if the company starts making money, then they guarantee the 25%. Nothing's guaranteed. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's based on the company. Yeah. So, what can the community do to help you grow your business? If you know anybody that wants to get into the cannabis business, um, please let me know. And uh, then I can give you all the, the financials and the contracts and, you know, show you a little bit more detail. I have some paperwork with me. Um, and, and what direction we want to go with the company down the road.